اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ و الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين ثم ما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين I have about 25 minutes I believe to share some ideas with you about some basic uh, basic teachings of our deen in regards to iman and a foundation, a strong foundation in our faith and our belief that we're all supposed to have so I'm going to start as though I am teaching this to my own children and they don't know anything about this stuff and we're going to start from scratch. Um, Allah Azza wa Jal, He created us, and He created us in two parts. There's a part of ourselves that is seen, our physical bodies, and there's a part of us that Allah installed inside the bellies of our mothers when we were still inside our mothers, and it came from the sky, it's from the Amr of Allah, it's from the command of Allah. That part of us was already intelligent before we even started our life. You know, as babies, we don't, know, we don't have any knowledge, we don't even know how to speak, we don't even know how to control our limbs, our eyesight isn't formed yet, our, our, you know, all, all of our faculties are going to develop over time and children will learn to speak and then understand more and more and as they slowly grow into adults uh, and actually become human beings, right? And eventually then, you know, once they look back at their life as they grow older, they mature in their knowledge. So when you look back at how you were and how you used to think when you were 18, when you look back at that when you were 35, you say, how could have I... I have been that stupid. But when you get to 50 and you look at yourself at 35, you look back and say, well, how could I have been that retarded, etc. Right? So you grow and you mature as age goes on. But there's a part of us that Allah put inside of us that was as mature then as it is now. That's a part of us, a ruh, that Allah created simultaneously it's from the world of Allah's command. It's not restricted to age. All of us existed, coexisted at the same time before we even came to this earth. And we all knew Allah, and we knew Allah so well that we directly had a conversation with Him. This conversation occurs, some of it, at least Allah tells us about it, in the seventh surah in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-A'raq. Allah asked all of us all that we were all together with Him, Abu, and I'm not even going to translate that as, as soul because that's problematic. Just Ruh, just get to learn that term. And Allah asked us if we don't recognize Him, am I not your master? Now, you know when I say, am I not? When you say, Alastu, am I not? Like you go to your friend and say, am I not your friend? Then you're already expecting an answer. What's the answer supposed to be? Of course you are. Why would you say that? So Allah asked a question that, by the way He asked the question, already suggests that He expects not, us, not just for us to know the answer, but to be embarrassed by the question and say, why would you say that? So the answer is, Bala, of course, why wouldn't it be? Bala, Shahidna, of course, we're, very, we're testifying. You know, do you want us to testify? We will, shahidna. So we go out of our way to say, why wouldn't we know that you are our master? Now Allah didn't just say, am I not God? He said, am I not your master? Believing in God is something. But believing in a master is something else. So people can believe in God and that God has no relationship with them. Right? You can believe in a God that created the universe. That's an invisible force. It's the unmoved mover, whatever philosophers may have called it before. And okay, it has nothing to do with me. It's this thing. It's God. It's the, the force in Star Wars, whatever it is. But it doesn't mean I have a personal relationship with it. The very first orientation we have in Iman was before we even came here. And in that orientation, Allah didn't just tell us His name, that He is Allah, that He is the creator of everything. That's not what He told us. The first thing He told us about Himself is His relationship with us. That he's the master and we're the slaves. That's the first bit of our education with Allah. And that started before we even got here. 
Then we come out of the wombs of our mothers. Then we come out of our moms and we're babies and we start growing up and our parents teach us about Allah and we, we start looking at the world around us. Now one of the areas that I wanted to talk about has already been addressed is when people have hard times, they start losing their faith in Allah. The only brief thing I'll add to that conversation, it's a side conversation, is that Allah Azza wa Jal did not leave us hanging when it comes to that problem. It's a very real problem that when people have very difficult time in their life, that they stop believing in Allah. They get so angry, how could Allah let all of this happen? How can you tell, tell me Allah is so merciful and I went through these terrible, terrible things in my life? Why wasn't He there to help me? That's a very real problem. So Allah does not just give us theoretical answers to that problem, like just say, just trust Allah and believe in Him and that's enough. Allah actually tells us very real historical stories, people's lives that have some very serious problems. A lot of times, for example, just on that side note, a lot of times, for example, parents can lose faith when their children are very sick, or when their children pass away, or when their children are taken, you know, may Allah protect our children. But when that happens, then, you know, why would Allah do that to a child? Why would that happen to a child? Is there a child mentioned in the Qur'an that went through very bad difficulty and a parent went through equally bad difficulty knowing that he doesn't even know what happened with his child? Can you think of anybody that's talked about in the Quran like that? Yusuf. Yusuf and his dad. They're both in a traumatic situation. A child being kidnapped, a child being taken to a different country, a child being sold as a slave. And it's one thing for parents to know my child died. It's a whole, a lot more painful to know I don't even know what happened with my child. I don't even know if he's okay. I don't know what's happening to him. That's even more painful. That pain doesn't go away. At least I would know what happened. At least I know his pain is ended. He's gone. I don't even know that. Allah did not just tell us to, to be patient. He taught us, look, this has happened to people before. Some really terrible things have happened, and these things, when they happen, they didn't take these people further away from Allah. They actually brought them closer to Allah. So why don't you learn what they were like? Maybe you'll learn something about yourself. Right? That's what Allah said. That's, that's a lot of difficulty. But that's not what I want to deal with directly. I want to deal with something else. I told you there's two parts of us, right? One of us was already there, fully mature, knowledgeable, and the most important bit of knowledge that part of us, our ruh, has. What's that most important bit of knowledge? The one Allah made it a point to mention in the Quran. That part of us already knows that we have a master, and that is Allah. That we have a master. Now, you know that a master is someone who has all the authority. He tells you what to do, and you do it. That's it. He tells you what to do, and you do it. Now, what if you don't do what your master tells you? Don't you get in trouble? In this world, there were slave owners before, and there were masters of people. If a slave doesn't do what the master tells him, does a slave get in trouble? Does he get tortured? Does he get beat up? Yes, he does. If you and I know we have a master, deep down inside, it's basically a life telling us deep down inside, in our subconscious, it's a big word for kids, but deep down inside we know, all human beings know that Allah is in fact our master. And what Allah does in revelation, like Qur'an, like before Torah, Injil, the reminders from the prophets, Allah calls all of those reminders. All of those revelations are called reminders. All the, the big job of all the prophets was to remind. Now you tell me, what is the difference between reminding you and informing you? When I inform you, I tell you something you didn't know before, right? But when I remind you, what's the point of reminding you? Did, is that something you already knew? Or is that new information? A reminder by definition is something you already knew. Something that was already there. Allah is telling us there's something already inside you and it's being refreshed. It's a review of what you already have inside you. That's what comes inside revelation. From this, scholars have derived a lot of things. And I don't want to complicate this conversation. I want to keep it simple. The simplest thing I want to tell you is what Allah taught us before we even got here. Allah is reviewing all of that and more when He sends Qur'an, when He sends His book, when He sends His messenger. So the two things are basically both education from Allah. In one, Allah talked to us directly. In the other, Allah talked to us, talks to us through a prophet. But in both of them, essentially, Allah is talking to us. What was the fundamental point? What was the first point Allah taught us when He talked to us directly? He told us that He is the Master. Well, you know what? Then you know what to summarize the Qur'an with. The point of the Qur'an is to understand that you are the slave, you're reminded that you are the slave and Allah is the master. But interestingly, this time, when Allah introduced Himself a second time, right? The first time He already introduced Himself. This is the second time He's introducing Himself to you and me through His book. The second time around, the first thing Allah introduces Himself with 
in the Quran, when you open up the Mus'haf and you start reciting, the first thing you read isn't that he's your Rabb. He doesn't ask you the same question again. He doesn't say, you remember I'm still your Rabb? The first statement he makes is Alhamdulillah. And that's really what I want to focus on. The first thing he says is, Alhamdulillah, all of you and, all, and, and myself, we recite it every time we make salat. We remind ourselves of this one phrase before we recite the rest of the Fatiha, Alhamdulillah. In other words, the, one of our most fundamental education, something natural to a human being, is the idea of wanting to be grateful and appreciative. I'm not even adding grateful and appreciative to Allah yet, just hamd. Hamd, is, hamd means to be grateful, to want to thank someone. And when do you thank someone? When they've done something good to you. That's when you thank someone. And to appreciate something nice has been done, something's beautiful, you appreciate it. What a nice city. What a, what a beautiful mountain. What a nice car. You appreciate good things. Two things together, to be grateful and to be appreciative. Is that something just limited to human beings or all decent human beings are grateful and appreciative? All decent human beings. This is not just something limited to Muslims, right? This is something that's base standard decency for all human beings. Now, people start losing faith when they go through difficulty. But people start also losing faith when they fail, they no longer, they're no longer grateful, and they're no longer, what? Appreciated. When they lose that basic foundation of, of wanting to do come, that's something we were programmed with. That was in our operating system, that was in, in, inside our personalities, before we even, you know, before we even developed further. We just, we want to be grateful, we want to be appreciated. But the, if that is, you rob yourself of that, you fail to be grateful, you fail to be appreciated, then you know what happens? Then you become self-absorbed. Let me give you a practical example, I don't want to talk in theory. Alhamdulillah, we're Muslims living in a country that's one of the wealthiest in the world despite the economic recession. If you think this is economic trouble, then go to some parts of the Muslim world and you'll see what economic trouble really looks like. Right? This is not economic trouble, by comparison. So we, we're, we're some of the most affluent Muslims on the planet. The, we're living here, even the ones that are middle class here, or lower middle class here, are living far better than most people living in other parts of the world. We're living very, very well. Which means we've gotten used to certain good things in our life. Things like a car, an air-conditioned apartment, regular electricity, hot water, a refrigerator full of food. These are things we take for granted because we have them available to us all the time. There are you know, things like you know, a constant cell phone connection, internet connection, etc. Et These things on top of things on top of things are just become a part of our life and we've just gotten used to them. Now the thing is when someone doesn't have anything, when somebody doesn't have anything, and they even get a little bit, when they even get a little bit, they're very, very grateful. Right? Isn't that natural? If somebody doesn't have anything, and they even get a little bit. You know, a family is very, very poor, they don't have much money at all, they can't even pay the electricity bill, and then somebody sends them a donation, they give their child a gift. Even if it's a used toy, are they going to appreciate that toy? Why? Because they don't have much. Right? So whatever little they have, they'll be very grateful for. But the opposite happens when you have a lot. When you have a lot, then you get so used to it, and you start feeling like you deserve it. It's yours. It's my room. It's my house. It's my car. It's my career. It's my computer. It's my toys. Mine, 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 mine. And when it's all yours, then you don't have to thank anybody else for it. Nobody else deserves, you know, you don't have to worry about anybody else that, that you're going to give credit to, because you're constantly, you're already in the back of your mind thinking this all belongs to who? Yourself. Yourself. And so you stop worrying about thanking Allah and appreciating Allah, you just start worrying about yourself. And the other thing that happens is, then even when a little bit is taken away from you, a little bit is taken away from you and me, what do we start doing immediately? Complaining. Why is the internet connection so slow? Why is the AC in the car not working? Why is there no orange juice in the fridge? Why is this coffee so cold? Why didn't you put an extra, you know, spoon of sugar? Immediately we start complaining. Immediately. We don't think of, uh, I mean, uh, let me tell you something about the philosophy of complaining in our religion. What, what the wisdom of complaining is. Essentially, a person will complain when they're already, they've already done justice to thank Allah. They've already thanked Allah enough, now they have time to complain. Complaining means that you have all the things you have to be grateful to Allah for, you've already done justice to that. Now you find time to complain. Is that the reality? If you and I were really people of Alhamdulillah, if we really were a people of Alhamdulillah, then we wouldn't find time or energy or even the motivation to do what? To 
complain. For every one thing that goes wrong, there's a million other things that are going right. There's so much that's going right in our lives. There's so much that Allah has blessed us with. And then Allah says something else. If you think something is going wrong, here's a formula. There's two things you can do. You can be ungrateful, meaning the same as you can complain. Or you can do what? What's the, what, are you, what are you supposed to do? Be grateful. Allah says, وَلَا إِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَا أَزِيدًا لَكُمْ If you're just grateful, I'll give you even more. I swear to it. Allah says, I swear to it, I'll give you more and more and more if you just be a little grateful. In other words, something went wrong. There's a little bit of less that you have now. You want more? Instead of complaining, what should you do? Be grateful. That's the formula Allah teaches us in the Quran. But what does this have to do with leaving faith? Let me come back to the topic at hand. You know, when people, when, when a, a person gets so used to getting, and they start feeling like they deserve it, then they're constantly worried about what they didn't get that they wanted to get. They're constantly looking for what they deserve, what they want, what they should have. And so their relationship with Allah isn't one of, I, I owe something to Allah, their relationship with Allah becomes reversed. Allah owes me something. I don't owe to Allah, Allah owes me. And so I'm going to ask Allah for something. I didn't get it. What kind of God is this? I asked him very directly. He told me, make dua, I made dua, it didn't come through. You know what? What's the point? I already have everything I need. I don't need to pray to God. I don't need to do that. The other side thing, before I go further, is when you become so obsessed with yourself, worrying about yourself, praising yourself, elevating yourself, concerned with yourself, then you have no time to be concerned with Allah. You yourself are too great in your own eyes for someone greater to, for you to be worried about. So our, our, you know, our, we, a lot of times for our own children, I argue we, for the adults here for a second, we dig our own graves. We give our children so much without teaching them gratitude that we actually, we're, we're signing their destruction. We're not giving them things that will make them great, that they'll make them grateful. Actually, it makes them more ungrateful. They get so used to getting and not used to thanking, not used to giving. That destroys Iman in and of itself. You don't even see the need for it. All of your needs are met. Why would you turn to Allah, the fulfiller of all needs? You never turned to Him before and all of your needs were met. So why would you feel the motivation to turn to Him? And it's at that point, you, that, at that point you can't even talk about Allah is your master and you're the slave. Because you're totally free, you do whatever you want. Have you heard your teenage, teenage kids say, I can do what I want. I'm a free person. You've heard that before, right? I can do whatever I want. I don't care. I'm an adult, you know. These words, what do they suggest? They're not slaves to you. But if there was one thing we could successfully teach our children and ourselves, if there was one thing, is you're a slave and Allah is master. If you can't teach that one lesson that Allah started humanity with, that first lesson, I'm not even saying the rest of the Quran, there's one lesson in Quran, alhamdulillah, just that lesson. Be grateful. That one lesson, we can't even talk about anything else because it's after Alhamdulillah, Allah reintroduces Himself as what? Rabbil Alameen. After that He says He's Rabb. First you have to learn Alhamdulillah. Then you can appreciate who your love is, who your master is. Now you're ready to obey, obey Him because you know He's done so much for you. And there's absolutely no way you can thank Him enough. The least you could do is recognize who He is to you. At least act like a slave. At least know that He's Rabb. This is at the heart of the problem. I've met young people in college that have taken a philosophy course or two, and then they come and they say, look, I'm not so sure if God exists, I'm not so sure if there's, you know, there's so many arguments against the existence of God, and I've read this website that, were, that was referred to before. All of that's fine. All of that's secondary. But if you actually get down to it, at the bottom of it, there's either one or two things. Either they had a really bad experience in their life, and they're blaming Allah, and they're angry. How come Allah didn't help them out? which was mentioned in the previous talk, or they really want to party. They really badly want to do whatever they want to do, and they don't want to feel like they have to answer to anybody. So the only thing that made them feel guilty was this idea that Allah is my master, and He's going to come, you know, He's going to ask me about what I did. Why don't I just get rid of this whole thing so I can party freely? That's at the bottom of it all. You can cover it up with philosophical arguments. And to those arguments, there are, there are very strong responses. It's not like we don't have responses to those things. But that's all secondary. Even if you respond to those things in my experience, that doesn't help the person. <laughs> because in the back of their mind, the problem is they refuse to accept themselves as a slave. It's too much of a life change. They refuse to accept that they have to be grateful to someone higher. That's the real problem. There's nothing else. It's really in the end nothing else. 
You have to be able to be honest with yourself when you're having these kinds of issues. Now, the, the last thing I want to share with you guys, in, in, especially the youth here, in regards to the kinds of things you read and the kind, kinds of things that start influencing you, we're living in a time, I had an earlier conversation with some folks about this. Actually, before I get to the youth, just a little bit beating up on the adults. How much time do I have left, by the way? I don't want to go over my time. 10 minutes? 19 minutes. 19 minutes? Really? Seriously? That was all 16 minutes? Okay. Okay, so a little bit on the adults. I told you the first lesson we have is that of Ham. What that means is we are on this earth to serve Allah. We were put on this earth to serve Allah. Let me tell you, even religious Muslims can flip that equation around. Their idea of religion becomes, I just want a house. What dua should I make? I just, my kid's getting married. Is there some surah I should be reciting? I'm expecting a baby during the delivery. Can I just, just recite surah of Maryam because she had a baby? Should I recite that right now? Or is that going to help me out? Or, you know, what dua can I read because I'm looking for, my, for a new job? Or what can, you know, constantly, what are, the, what are some things in the religion that can make my life easier? In other words, I'll put it in simple language for you. How can the religion serve me? I'll put it as simple as that. What is Allah revealed that can serve me? Well, the original equation was what? What can I do to serve Allah? Let me just flip the equation. And I'm not saying those things don't exist. I'm not saying that there aren't du'as that bless your house and gatherings where you can get the ruqya to, to, to heal the, the sick, etc. These are things in our religion. But as my teacher used to teach us, these things are what you call benefits with the job. These are the benefits. Your real job is to be a slave, to serve Allah. And when you truly serve Allah, you get these benefits. What did the Muslim become interested in? All the benefits and none of the responsibilities. That's what we became a culture of. So it's not even a study of, is this an authentic hadith and is this not? Or, that's not even the point. The point is, are you here to be served or are you here to serve? Have you understood what uh, the mission of my life is to show some gratitude to Allah? You know how many sacrifices Ibrahim السلام, made? How many incredible sacrifices he made السلام, And one of the most comprehensive descriptions of his entire life you know, Allah summarizes all of the amazing adventures of Ibrahim in one phrase. Shakiran bi anhumihi. He was grateful to some of Allah's favors. Allah summarizes all of his sacrifices, all of his incredible accomplishments with one phrase. That was all motivated, motivated by one thing. He just wanted to be grateful to, Allah, to some of the things he could recognize in Allah in, in the favors that Allah has done to him. That's all that was. SubhanAllah. That's what a slave does. His entire motivation is, I just want to be grateful to Allah. When gratitude dies, faith goes with it. Uh, the sense of gratitude dies, faith goes with it. <coughs> the indulgence that we've created for ourselves is killing our sense of gratitude. And when it's killing our sense of gratitude, there's no, there's no surprise that we're having a crisis of faith. That we're having a hard time believing. You know? So this is one bit that I wanted to remind myself of and all of you of. May Allah Azza wa make us of those who truly do hamd of Allah Azza wa and recognize Him as their Rabb. The second thing I wanted to talk to you about in our, in our time is the idea of honoring something and respecting something. Traditional societies, Muslim and non-Muslim, older societies, there was this idea that something deserves respect and you don't make fun of it. You don't talk dirty about it, you don't talk down about it, you don't disrespect it. Whether it was Hindu culture or Buddhist culture or Christian culture or Jewish culture or Muslim culture, we all had something in common. There were some things that you don't make fun of. Even if you don't believe in it, you don't make fun of it. You know, even in our religion, we are, the, we are the, probably the most harsh religion when it comes to standing up against shirk. You know that, right? We are probably the toughest religion when it comes to standing up against shirk. Even then, we're told not to make fun of other people's gods. You have to show respect to people what they have regard for. Because then they won't respect your religion. We can't make fun of other people's religion. We can't laugh at them. There's an idea of respecting everything. But we've come at a time where the most important thing in the world today isn't knowledge, isn't wisdom. In my opinion, the most important thing in most individuals' lives has become entertainment. The, most co the thing that we have in common in the globe among people is mobile devices where we're watching movies or we're playing video games. We're entertaining ourselves. And you know what, what entertainers do is they try to come up with newer and newer things to get people to watch them, to get entertained by them. And you know as a result what's happened is entertainment has become more and more obscene. 
more and more shameless, it crosses the line every year after year after year, it becomes more and more disrespectful, language becomes more and more inappropriate, what PG-13 was in 1985 is not what PG-13 was in 1995, and it's certainly not what it was in 2005, and today, it's, forget it, it wouldn't even have been R back then, and now it's PG. The, the standards keep dropping, and with it, all the things that used to be respected in society no longer deserve respect, you can just make fun of them. You can just make fun of things. So have you seen or heard of cartoons that make fun of God, that make fun of prophets, that make fun of the Bible, that make fun of the Quran, people that make fun of the Prophet Not just our religion, the Christian faith, the Jewish faith, you know, the idea of God, the idea of religion, making fun of prophets, making fun of Ibrahim This became part of common culture. A culture in which you don't have to respect anything. You don't have to respect anything. You know when you don't respect something is when you think it's less than you. Right? When you don't respect something, that means it's pathetic, it's less than you. So by sh showing a lack of respect to these things, we are already acknowledging how arrogant we've become. How above everything that we criticize, we are. We are in a position to criticize. Somebody says, how come the Qur'an says this? It doesn't make any sense. You are in a position to criticize, just like some reader who read a book on Amazon.com and gave it two stars. I didn't like the introduction that much. The author's kind of repeating himself too much. Didn't make sense in chapter 3. So you're going to critique what Allah says because obviously the one who criticizes is in a position of power or the one being criticized is in a position of power. Who's in a position of power? You are now. You are now. But when we say Allah is Rab and I'm Abd, I'm slave, who's in a position of power? Allah is. You've already put, you've negated the idea that you are Abd when you come with that attitude. That attitude in and of itself is the exact opposite of what a slave is supposed to be. That's the starting point. When you are not looking to be grateful, when you're not seeking to find out why you, why you come to this earth, if your purpose in life is to become entertaining yourself, pleasing yourself, if that's the purpose you, you, that's left for you, then there's no doubt about it, you will have problems with your faith. You will have questions. You will keep raising doubt after doubt after doubt. You will have no regard for saying, why, why did the Prophet say that? Why did the Prophet say this? That doesn't make any sense. You know, you'd watch it before you talked about the Prophet if you had even the slightest idea that he's the ambassador of Allah's guidance to this earth. You'd watch how you talk about him. Even if there was a little bit of this thought in your head, and this is Allah's final messenger, sallallahu And you know, Allah has so much regard for him that if people just call him casually by his first name, as they did, some people did when he was alive, all of their good deeds were multiplied by zero. They didn't even insult him, they just called him casually. So I better watch it when I talk about the Prophet I better watch it when I talk about the Quran. We don't have that attitude anymore because we're in a culture where nothing deserves respect. Everything's open to criticism. You can talk about everything just any which way. It's no big deal. What's the big deal? I'm just asking a question. That's the attitude that it's become. This is not the attitude of a slave. May Allah instill in us the natural decency that He put in us without even Islam being revealed. The decency that we already had. The decency that already told us that we have a master and we have to be humble and we have to look for reasons to be grateful all around us. May Allah especially help us, the parents in the audience, raise children that have a sense of gratitude in their personalities. That they're grateful for the things they have and they're not arrogant about it and they appreciate the gifts that Allah has given them. And may Allah make us of those that the uh, parents and everybody here, examples of people that are grateful to Allah. And by showing that gratitude, that by, by doing that itself, they reinforce the faith of the people around them. Barakallahu alaykum wa 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 alaykum